Thank you all very much for uh, hanging on through a very long and intense day, getting uh, a drink from a fire hose in information wise in every session. Uh, this is a session on street design. My name is Victor Dover. I'm principal in charge at a firm called Dover Colon Partners. We're town planners and urban designers. By way of background, we work about half the time for local governments and community groups and about half the time for private developers, although not in the same place at the same time. And I, I used to be the chair of uh, CNU's national organization. Our office is in Miami, in the, in the, specifically in the town of South Miami. And um, I'm gonna get to share with you some experiences about uh, street design, which is uh, my favorite topic. I got involved in this uh, partly because uh, I began to gradually realize over the years that this was the one thing that could make the most difference at implementing great urbanism. And it was also the one thing most often gotten wrong. And so uh, what I'm gonna take you through today is a, a wide ranging uh, set of topics. Uh, it will include some uh, look at newly completed streets, at newly retrofit streets, at old streets, uh, and we'll uh, work on vocabulary building for the way of making streets that make a difference in people's lives. Uh, what we do in urban design and town planning is basically execute on the before and after concept. We help people visualize change before it occurs. So we imagine the places that are there and how they would be modified to be the places we would rather have. That's the basic objective of the urbanist. So now it doesn't matter whether we're working on retrofitting some brittle piece of suburbia that has outlived its economical usefulness and needs to be replaced with something much more resilient and fine grained, or whether we're building a new, a new settlement on previously undeveloped land, or we're working in the heart of the historic parts of the metropolitan region. In every single case, in order to execute on that before and after idea, you need to be able to look at the street that you've got and imagine how you would turn it into the street that you would rather have. Um, so uh, my basic thesis sounds too simple to be true, and it's because basically we had to, had to convince ourselves after a long period of time that it really was that simple. If we could get the streets right, a lot of the rest of the things uh, that you hope to get right in urbanism will fall into place naturally. Uh, and if you get the streets wrong, all that effort will still leave you with a place that makes you wonder, is that really all the best we can do? Um, now, if I'm walking down the street past a blank wall or a, a big parking lot, I'm walking down a street where that one site planning decision of the, on the adjacent lot has uh, actually got regional implications. You know, say one stretch of blank wall or uh, one big parking lot I have to walk by to just to get to someplace on the other side. That's probably an experience that's gonna make me say, well, this wasn't very good. If I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little sunburned or embarrassed or bored or scared or what have you, and I'm not gonna do that again. So the next time I need to go from A to B in that location, I'm gonna get behind the wheel and take the same trip. And all of a sudden, I'm now switching from green mobility in the most natural sense there is, walking, to ungreen mobility, pumping out emissions out of my tailpipe, using up fossil fuels probably, congesting your, your road network, uh, demanding parking spaces on both ends of that trip. So what you begin to understand is that the little decisions about the building to street relationship and the little decisions about the design inside the right of way itself can have these huge far reaching implications. If you would like to have a region that is resource efficient and a nice place to be, uh, you probably would love it if people would walk, bike, or use transit more, right? The way you execute on that belief or that desire is in a very close up and local way. Now, a street like this is, is a different kind of experience from the blank wall of the ugly parking lot because I'll enjoy walking down a street like that. I'll, look, I'll, I'll peer inside the windows to see what's going on inside. I'll feel safe in that location. I'll probably have some shade and what have you. And now my decision is the next time I need to go from A to B, I'm gonna do it on my two feet or on two wheels instead of four. John Massengale and I went on a big journey, an odyssey really, to produce over three and a half years uh, with a lot of help from many people uh, in the CNU and in our offices, a book on street design. It's a big, fat, 
heavy doorstop of a thing. Uh, you don't need one. You need 10, so you can give nine away. <laughs> and it's full of pictures. And, and, uh, and we, we went out on to the streets we knew well and streets that were suggested to us by others. And we remeasured them and we photographed them and walked them up and down and asked questions about why certain ones were successful and others were not. John taught me a tremendous amount as we did this. And over that long period of time, staying up late at night, arguing about what it was about the best streets that made them good, we narrowed down into the material that's in the book. 15,000 new photographs or so later, we had 500 or so we could put in this book. The main reason for to do it was somewhat subversive because we were hoping that people would take those pictures and maybe you'll take some of the ones in our, in our slides today and go into that meeting with the public works director or the DOT or the mayor or what have you and say, if they used to be able to make streets like this, why can't I have a street like that now? Well, take a look at this picture. Now, this fellow is in Stockholm, so he's making his daily commute on two wheels and it's about five degrees Fahrenheit when he's doing it. But yeah, he was whistling. As he went by me and I, I carefully waited for him to get just to the right place in the frame to take that photograph, he went on by and he was whistling a tune. He was the happiest man in Stockholm. Uh, his mood was improved by the experience he was having in the public realm. And it's all because somebody took the trouble to take a pencil and draw two straight lines parallel to each other and plant trees along those two straight lines on the map. And it's as simple as that. And the gift they gave him was that every day his daily commute is this kind of experience. Uh, how many of us can say our daily commute looks that good and feels that good? There are not many hands going up. Okay. Uh, so as we, as we look around at the history, we figure out very quickly that human beings have historically been very, very good at making streets. What an amazing species we are. We were good at streets. And Americans, uh, perhaps as good at making streets as any civilization ever. Um, and uh, we did quite well with it. We tended to pr produce streets that would become the postcard-like symbols for their communities. Uh, experiences, not just transportation facilities. And they're different. As you go from place to place, they're very locally distinct. That local distinctiveness comes out of the landscape materials and the trees are from the species that belong in that place. And the way of making the long vista will vary depending on whether there's a Pacific Ocean at the end of it, as it is in that case, uh, or not. And the architecture will vary. And the building to street relationships have their own grammar uh, that's regional and climate specific and cultural. But as we, um, as we find when we look at the historical examples, did a few things pretty consistently that made the streets turn out really well. One of them, simple as it can be, is we thought about what people would see in the distance and placed the building on the axis, uh, with terminating or deflecting the vista in some special way, so as to lend importance uh, to the buildings of civic significance, for example, by the geometry of the plan. And we always took basic, fundamental, mundane even infrastructure projects and made them into something far more worthwhile and multidimensional. For example, once upon a time in New Orleans, the city elders decided to create a transportation facility. It's the streetcar line on St. Charles Avenue. But we don't even think of it as a transportation facility. We think of St. Charles Avenue as a great address. It's a linear park almost in the city. That median in the center in New Orleans, they call that the, the neutral ground which I think sounds like they're supposed to have a duel out there. <laughs> and they put the streetcar down the center of it and then they planted trees in rows uh, in such a way that they got that tremendous linear park effect that became like a spine or an anchor for the whole neighborhood. And so the lucky people who live in the adjacent houses or go to the Catholic girls school or, or eat in one of the restaurants along the, the St. Charles line uh, have this experience. They don't just get from A to B, but they have this place. So the great streets that we like to admire are the ones that are not just a way of getting from one place to another, but places in their own right as well. Now, if you look, study these pictures, you see like almost like archeologists peeling back layers of history. You begin to see clues as to how people really use them. Do you see the, in the center of this picture, the, uh, the worn areas here in the sod? 
Anybody know what that is? The running path, exactly. And so in, on St. Charles Avenue, the joggers and runners, they run right down the center or along the tracks. And when the streetcar comes, they just step aside like this, let the car go by, and they step back in, and they continue on their way seven seconds later, and it's no big deal. And under uh, contemporary practice, this whole thing would probably be fenced off with concertina wire with razors on it and red flashing lights and alarms. Uh, to avoid having these modes of travel intermixed. But in the historical examples, we prove that we're actually quite good at it. Now, history also shows us something else, uh, of a bizarre kind of aberration in human history. Somewhere in the 20th century, we did, in fact, lose our way. Do you want to see that one more time? We went from doing these <laughs> to doing these. Okay. And you all know the story. It's kind of a backbone story of the new urbanism. Um, we lost our way as we began to to change up uh, our traditions of design to forget what the place is supposed to be like and instead just think of it by the numbers, whether those numbers are expressed in levels of service by the traffic engineer or uh, expressed in density and dwelling units per acre by the city planner um, or what have you. Um, somehow this met all of the criteria when all we had was planning by the numbers. And this, uh, problem is basically one of abandoning the public realm that made our fellow in Stockholm so happy he would whistle. Public realm. Um, term most of you know, but the new urbanists use it all the time to describe the fact that the spaces between the buildings are as important as the quantity of space inside the buildings. And the public realm, much neglected, needs a lot of our help, especially the part of that that is street. I'm always moved when I pull this picture back out uh, by the great effort that has been made to remind us to watch for pedestrians in that place. Actually, if you look in the distance, uh, this is in northwest Arkansas, there's a little hint of the way they used to build the city, um, you know, a few blocks further into the downtown. And then in the foreground, all the indications that we really didn't expect people to walk or bike or use transit or even do the things they want to do on a great address um, in that one. So what are the great addresses like? There are certain things that when you get them right, consistently become the places where people want to be. Uh, if you stand on this intersection, which is actually just a pretty routine intersection um, in that part of, of Paris, uh, and watch the parade of life go by, what you'll realize is that the people's experience is what makes them come back here. The buildings themselves are relatively simple by Parisian standards. Uh, the retail is not uh, elaborate uh, by the uh, scientific standards that Seth described in the previous session. And yet, this is a place where people just consistently want to come back to again and again. So you can see that also in uh, the, the classic American high streets. This is one of those streets, this one's in Galena, Illinois, that's always labeled as one of the America's favorite main streets. It wins those polls every year uh, or comes in, up in the top two or three. People love to go to the main street in Galena. Uh, and there's nothing all that uh, complicated about it. The, the buildings form a public room. The street deflects in this very gentle and pleasing way, so the, your eye is constantly treated to something new as you move along the curve. The doors and windows face the street. Um, it really is that simple. The public realm happens on our high streets, but it also happens on our simple um, elm streets as well. Americans once upon a time had the habit of facing the public space with the fronts of the buildings. This is, uh, you thought I was going to tell you about curb-to-curb -curb dimensions and design speeds. Well, I am. But first, I'm going to say the most important thing is that the fronts of the building space, the public space, and the street is the most important public space that you have. When you forget that simple, basic rule, I don't care if the numbers are exactly the same. You will never get the effect. For example, uh, this picture and this picture are exactly the same land use. They're single-family detached houses at a certain number of dwelling units per acre in their density. Uh, they have about the same size lots. They have about the same number of parking spaces uh, on each lot and so on. The difference between them is basically that this one was done according to the grammar of traditional urbanism in which the fronts of things like the front door, the front porch, or the balcony or the storefront belong in the fronts of the buildings and shape the public room that is, that is the public realm. And this one was done after we began to put on the front of the buildings those uh, features which we consider mo more important in our lives, uh, the four-wheeled ones. 
Where would you prefer to live? Now, as a result of building a whole lot of that ladder approach to, um, to development, um, we have had a crisis of confidence. And now what we need is to reestablish the confidence in the American people that we can have growth and change and make things better rather than worse. Because too many pictures like this just reinforce their hardwired conditioning to be suspicious of growth and change. Um, if you're going to do that, then I don't want anything to do with it. Um, so how do we reestablish that confidence? The first thing we need to do is recognize that it is our task to build our way out of our problems. As we accommodate an ever-growing population, we have to figure out a way to do it in such a way that fills in the places that we've already started and makes them more complete and makes them more elegant and charming uh, and also more functional and uh, practical and, and uh, useful for our daily needs, including transportation needs. If we can reestablish that confidence, then we can build in the places we've already started and accommodate the growing population in a way that helps solve problems rather than create new ones. Now, uh, how many are elected officials? Just curious. Okay. How about city officials in local government? Okay. How about developers and, and community groups? Okay. Here, I'm going to give you some things that you can ask for uh, that uh, are there every time when the streets turn out well. And then we give you five things that you can ask about. And they appear in every street design project in varying degrees but you're going to be looking for them. The first one is that the street has a shape. Remember this gesture that the new urbanists keep making? This isn't the University of Miami, it's all about the U. This is the height to width proportion of the things on the side of the, of the street that give it a three-dimensional spatial enclosure, a shape, uh, like buildings and trees, versus the width between them. And as that space gets wider and wider and wider, the sense of place just diminishes. So rule number one is shape. And you actually diagram that. Um, there's lots of literature about this. And you just go back and squint at the streets you like in your town, and you'll probably see that there's a discernible shape. It might be on, say, a, a main street or a high street, like this one in John Massengale's beautiful photograph from Great Barrington, uh, a continuous row of buildings that's forming that public uh, room, forming the wall of it. Or it might be a discontinuous where there are gaps between buildings, but the essential rhythm is established by the buildings along the street. Number two, it feels good to be in them. Most importantly there is that it's climate adapted. So if you're in a hot and humid and sticky place, you probably need adaptations in the architecture to produce uh, shade when you're on the sidewalk, um, to protect the storefronts from the glare and sudden storms. If you're in a temperate zone, you probably need street trees that those deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the winter so that the sun can come in there and warm the sidewalk and you on it and also warm the building. In the summertime, they fill back out uh, and the sun rises to a higher angle and they keep the street in shade. Um, pretty basic stuff. When we get that equipment in place, you're a lot more likely to walk. When we don't have it, <laughs> we're a lot more likely to get this. What do you think? Is this fellow comfortable? Number three, they go somewhere. The streets that we love are the ones that are connected to the larger system. They're part of an integrated network of walkable streets. Uh, they tend not to be isolated. Well, um, you can actually measure this too. You can ask how many intersections per square mile. There's an elaborate uh, calculation you can do under lead for neighborhood development. Or how much route directness is there? How many uh, links and nodes? How, many, how big is the average block size? These are the kinds of things you can, you can check. Uh, looking for more intersections. When there are more intersections, by the way, it helps a lot with traffic because when there's only a few, as in, say, the example here, uh, everybody making a, one of their basic daily movements needs to come to one of the few intersections everybody has to share. So guess what? Traffic bunches up in those at the peak hour. Um, and here at the same scale is a place with a few more. This is a proto-project that just preceded the new urbanism. You can kind of begin to see things returning to a pattern of blocks in the streets, so although they're not quite there. Uh, the new urbanists, pat us on the back, uh, you know, managed to get the, the frequency of intersections per square mile to go back up. Um, here, uh, 10 times as many intersections per square mile as the example uh, from the 1960s. So, but uh, just to keep us from getting too cocky, here's Rome at the same scale. 
The more intersections there are, the smaller the streets can be um, because you're spreading the, the uh, travel demand out across a very permeable network. And you might compare this to, um, say, the way that a, a, a cell phone works. In the old model, with a wired phone that was connected to the wall, uh, your landline's cable connected to a bigger cable up on the pole and then a bigger cable down the street. Uh, it went downtown to uh, uh, Lily Tomlin, the, the uh, operator who plugged you in and then back through another cable to the other person on the other end, right? So all of those cables had to get fatter and fatter and fatter to carry all of our traffic, in this case signals, uh, and then go back down the tree uh, to the other end. Your cell phone doesn't work that way. In fact, there are lots of intersections, uh, those are the cell phone towers on the poles, and each of them carries a relatively light volume um, each. As you, and so that is how a network works. Uh, the power of the network in the case of, of uh, traffic is well documented, but you may not know this. Just like mixing land uses shortens trips and causes your carbon footprint to go down, or building at higher density has all these environmental benefits, if you want to lower your, car your carbon footprint, connect your streets. Because at a certain point, the CO2 implications of the way you build uh, plummets like a rock with increasing intersections per acre or per square mile. Fourth, and not least important, but very important, that street has to be safe. Uh, now part of that is just getting over the fear that you're going to be run over. So um, this is a diagram from the National Association of City Transportation Officials book on the design of urban streets. It's really beautiful because that highlight, the, the bright area in the center, shows you how much of your field of vision is really effectively seeable at a given speed. So at the bottom, this is 30 miles an hour. And then next, 25, 20, and 15 miles an hour. And so what you're seeing is as we slow down, as we move through public space with our big, dangerous vehicles, we can take in a lot more information about our surroundings. And because we're moving more slowly, we have more time to react before something bad happens. And because we're moving more slowly, if something bad does happen, it's not nearly as bad. So speed is incredibly important. Keeping the pace slow everywhere we can, especially in those places where we want pedestrians and cyclists to share the space. Uh, absolutely incredible, incredibly important. Not that every street should be a super slow street. I'm not suggesting that we change the interstate highway to, to 20 miles an hour. But that if you're thinking in context, and you're saying that you want a certain uh, segment along an important street to be the main street for that community, you should probably think about finding ways to get the design speed down. And I don't mean just the posted speed, but the design speed. Uh, safety goes into all kinds of other dimensions. For example, safety for people who are on two wheels instead of on four. This is an interesting picture because they actually took the, the public and probably controversial decision to use more of the right of way uh, for one thing than another. They, they s separated off and created a whole section of the street uh, that's for those people who are moving back and forth in a bus, in a taxi, or on a bike. Bus and bike combined lanes being a very clever thing to do. Um, and then they did that knowing that the remaining space devoted to automobile traffic, here seen at the peak hour, would experience more congestion. And our cyclists in this picture include the guy on the left who's all spandexed up and clipped in and in the drops and going fast and getting his workout. It also includes the young lady just to his right who's dressed much more casually, doesn't have a helmet. And to her right, the fellow who's taking a break who's on his daily commute. He's dressed for work. He's a little older. He's got a backpack on. He's got fat tires on his bike. What does that tell us? We're a complex species. We have different needs. And we should be designing the streets so that they work well for people who are uh, who are going about their lives in different ways, not all the same way. Uh, now, safety goes way beyond just how we design that stuff in the right of way or set up the speed. It also includes Jane Jacobs' basic concept of natural surveillance. She called it eyes on the street, uh, which doesn't just mean that you make sure doors and windows face the street so that bad guys are scared to commit crimes in that space, although it does mean that. It also means that if you as a pedestrian are there, you feel safer because uh, you know that if you were to call out for help or something bad were to happen to you or you were to, to drop with heart failure, there's a chance someone else will know about you, see it, hear you, etc. 
so safety is pretty important. Now, the last of the five criteria is the most elusive. Um, the streets that really make their way um, into the lexicon of the, of the best streets, the ones we have to emu emulate, usually have something a little extra special to offer uh, as the experience too. And it can be very, very minor. It can be something like the Spanish moss that hangs from that single uh, street tree in the little town, really the little village of Micanopy. Uh, or it could be something like uh, something the neighbors did. This is guerrilla street marking uh, uh, done uh, in the middle of the night by frustrated neighbors um, who knew they needed to make that place for kids. Oh yeah, I was one of those neighbors. <laughs> I can show you how to spray paint those if you want to know how to do that. <laughs> now, memorable comes in other packages as well. John Nolan, uh, the, uh, the great urban designer, town planner, uh, trained up as a landscape architect. And when he came to uh, Charlotte in the early 1920s, he said, let's plant native trees. This was before that was a fashionable idea. Let's plant the trees that grow well in these soils in the nearby forest. And let's plant a nursery full of them. And then let's plant six of them with every house and let's line them up on Queens Road because someday the people who are sharing the road are gonna have the experience of passing through a climax forest and with this uh, ceiling overhead formed by those trees, much like the arches of a Gothic cathedral overhead. So that's how they get memorable. You know, memorable can be done with the uh, most ordinary of things, even parking. <laughs> this is a street we discovered, uh, John and I uh, in Paris, this is the Avenue Diana. It's the most beautiful parking lot in the world. There are multiple uh, lines of parking along the tree lines that make up that multi-way boulevard. Uh, and you hardly notice it, because after all, it has this great accessory at the end called the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, <laughs> but there is actually, if you count it up, there's a phenomenal amount of parking, like close to 400 parked cars per block in the street. Um, so you begin, quickly begin to realize there'd be no reason to do a Walmart parking lot in that context. You could just do it like this, and the street itself would contain a lot of the parking and become a neighborhood asset, uh, as this one did. Now, part of the problem that we run up against is that um, your local public works department probably has a manual that's only a few pages thick that has the standard cross sections they have decided they're supposed to use when new communities are built or old streets are retrofit. Your DOT district probably has uh, a big fat book uh, that they use to say, well, I can only do the ones in here. That menu. Uh, tends to be really restricted. Uh, it's based on a very false choice idea that's described uh, in uh, a manual called the Ashto Green Book that uh, says you have to choose uh, mobility or land access. And uh, you have to have one or the other. And the assumption is that as mobility, uh, cross town movements, what have you, becomes more important, uh, that land access has to be reduced. And they break the world down into two kinds of land. Rural, by which they mean suburban. And urbanized, by which they mean suburban. <laughs> That's true. And then they break the streets down into three types, arterials, collectors, and locals. And they probably have one or two designs for each of those, and that's it. So the menu is extremely limited. Uh, and you'll be you're caught, especially if you want to take the most important thousand feet of the most important thoroughfare in your town and say that's our high street, you'll probably run up against that limited menu. Someone's going to say, I can't do, let you do that. The manual doesn't set me up that way. Now, that doesn't mean the flexibility is not there. I can show them, and if you want, I'll show you where to show them. In that very book, it says where they have lots and lots of flexibility. And they can be more creative in the interpretations than that if the local government and the, and the authorities will establish more functions for this street other than just driving fast. But that old assumption that wider and faster roads are always the better roads is embedded because that's the only function we ask the engineers to, to, to consider. If we ask the engineers to also consider whether that's a great street to hold the 4th of July parade or whether it's a great street to sell people things or a great street to walk or bike on, uh, then the function has been redefined. And that is the key to getting to turn to another page in the manual and do the right thing instead, okay? Uh, so if you don't know that, and you look, say, at the cover of the Wisconsin DOT manual from not too many years ago, 
you'll see the menu and it looks like this. This is the city designed as a tree in the way that Seth described before. Um, you have the freeway, the arterial road, the collector road, and local road. And notice how they're not designed to connect except by car. And so you get this. Because as the system you just saw in diagrammatic form metastasizes and the intersections get bigger and bigger and the volumes get bigger and bigger, you get more and more of this kind of expense and land consumption and car devotion. But empower yourself with the knowledge of how it was done through history and bring that picture of an example of a great street uh, and you can, break, you can dislodge that problem. We need a bigger menu of street types. There are um, plenty of them that we can document that have been well tested and yet there's always creativity going on, adapting and, and reinventing uh, the many types. Uh, from the big roads like the multi-way boulevards to the main streets, to the skinny streets, to the skinnier streets. Um, there, we used to be really good at designing for the whole range of human experiences, not just the wider and faster car travel experience. Uh, so in, in our book, John and I identify 11 fundamental types. And there's some overlap between these. Um, but you'll see this, this vocabulary is a, a little more place specific than uh, say the arterial collector and local. But instead, the boulevard and the avenue and the main street and what have you. I'll show you a few examples of, of those as we go here. A couple things to remember. First, small is beautiful uh, as uh, we were admonished as kids. Uh, but uh, small also helps us lead to slow and slow is safe. Take a look at this street from Forest Hills Garden. This breaks a lot of rules. Okay, um, so tiny radius here at the corner. My friend Walter Kulash is fond of pointing out that if you see a little black rubber tire mark on a curb like that, it probably means that someone just got a gentle reminder that this is a place where kids live or an old person might be walking across the street. And you know, here we're not talking about uh, Gotham City. We're talking about a leafy and tranquil suburban street. Then there's this tree that's uh, positioned very close to the corner. Total violation of a lot of the rules. Uh, but guess what? This is a street where people don't go terracing around the corner at high speeds with their car up on two wheels and uh, as they do it because all of the visual cues in this place tell them this is a slow design location. So you drive more slowly. Um, add to that the narrow cross section. The curb to curb dimensions are tight. The trees are between the sidewalk and the moving cars, which of course gives a great deal of comfort to the pedestrians um, they wouldn't otherwise have. It's amazing how often that is reversed. So uh, go out into your own town, into your own historic district, and document the great streets that haven't yet been molested or undone, and show them. And you can also ask the fire marshal, do you not respond to emergencies in that location? <laughs> I guarantee you the driver of the, of the biggest fire truck they have will pump up and say, I can get through there. I do it all the time. Never. So when we ask the specialists, the specialists in how many feet of, of distance need to be between the cable TV conduit and the sewer pipe, um, the specialists who decide how uh, wide the road should be just in case somebody goes fast and needs a little more room to lose control and regain it, uh, the specialists in the, uh, the street light <laughs> and the lighting, uh, when we ask them what all of their standards are, and we just combine their standards into one scene, we will invariably get this kind of metastasized and negative experience. Now, we like to hand out keypad polling devices at big public meetings. And we recently had an audience of about 500 people, and we passed out these keypads and asked, uh, did your parents walk to school? Everybody remembers the story. Their parents walked to school five miles uphill in the snow both ways. Uh, that story? Just out of curiosity, how many of you, your own parents said that at some point they walked or biked to school? Okay. You know what's coming next. <laughs> and we asked about yourself. Now, same, how, of you, uh, same audience, how many of you yourselves walked or biked to school? Okay, it's a little smaller. All right, what about the kids in your family and in your neighborhood, your grandkids? Now, nowadays, how many of them walk or bike to school? Okay, not nearly as many. That's not to say that safe routes to school is the only thing that matters, but it tells you that it's an indicator of something fundamentally gone wrong in civilization that we can only fix with better street design. Um, 
So uh, I don't know if you've looked at it, but every couple of years, uh, the uh, Smart Growth America uh, puts out um, a report they call Dangerous by Design, and they assign a pedestrian danger index to uh, each uh, locality and each state. And you actually can go into their interactive map and zoom in on your own town and see where the accidents occur. Click on the, on the dot and see whether it, what kind of uh, injury or event it was and on what date it happened. And what you'll discover, of course, is that they are um, very sadly clustered, in, especially in the Sun Belt, in places that are built more recently. Now, um, Rick Hall showed me some years ago showed us this chart that compares 20 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour when there's a pedestrian auto collision. We don't like calling them accidents. When there's a collision, at 20 miles an hour, uh, one time out of 20, 5% of the time, there's a fatality. If you just a little uptick in speed leads to a great uptick in mayhem because at 30 miles an hour, it's, there's gonna be a fatality over 50% of the time under those same circumstances. What it suggests is that the speed of the street, not the posted speed, the design speed, uh, can make a huge difference in the saving of human life. Uh, now, meanwhile, we have uh, a curious species that has reasserted itself in this habitat, the cyclist. Uh, and we have a whole generation of demanding Americans who are now saying, we're coming back into the streets, and we're coming back on two wheels. And whether you're ready for us or not, here we come. I love this picture because he is looking defiant and confident there. <laughs> this is in Chattanooga. He's about to do it. His girlfriend is looking at him. Are you sure? Are you sure we should do this? Um, this, is, this is where we are. But meanwhile, if you go to a lot of our revitalizing downtown places, yes, even in, in, in places around here, uh, and you go look, the bike rack will be full at a lot of the time because uh, it's something un unheard of just 20 years ago. People are coming back into those streets. And so uh, there's a really important and earnest effort under the banner of the Complete Streets Movement to do something quick uh, and meaningful to indicate that the cyclists are welcome in this habitat. Uh, so here's one of those uh, uh, relatively quick and inexpensive projects, are very, uh, very much compliant with chapter and verse with the uh, manuals these days, there's the car turning left and the bikes going straight, swerve past each other, there's lots of paint. Um, that's, uh, that's where we are in, in the very beginnings of a, what could be a tremendous and great complete streets movement. Here's an example from Fort Lauderdale. They made this into a complete street by, planting, by uh, painting bright green, the same exact color as the highway exit ramp signs. Uh, and lots of bright yellow and so on, uh, adding on street parking. And of course, they forgot the street trees, they forgot uh, the, the buildings that form the rest of the public realm. So I don't know, you tell me, complete street? No, we need completer than this streets. Um, so uh, John and I eventually began saying over and over, it's not a complete street if it's not yet a beautiful street. It's to, to think about how far we can go with this. It's worth looking at places that have been working for a lot longer for, and a lot harder on integrating uh, walking, biking, and transit back into their street scene. Uh, so now here's a, here's a boulevard in Paris which is not on the tourist maps. This is, these are ordinary Parisians for the most part uh, experiencing this street. And here they have the, uh, the, the vehicular lanes and the walking next to the storefronts, they have the bus rapid transit lines, they have the people on the cycle track which goes between the trees, back further in the median, they have folks walking, and they have the, the subway running underneath. Um, what do you think, more complete? This or this? Okay. So the more mature cities uh, in, uh, have been working for longer at getting the, the bikes integrated into their scene. And not just because they were always there, but because they made a conscious social decision, uh, like the ones the Dutch made in the 1960s, uh, that that was gonna be part of how they built and maintained their towns. And in Amsterdam, their cars, they're very expensive cars, in fact, um, and they share the space with uh, the many cyclists and pedestrians in that place. And their world doesn't come to an end. So we are in a weird, awkward, ugly duckling teenage stage when it comes to street design. 
one where we know we have to do something, so we have to do something quick, and it often leads to the stapling of ugly yellow and white plastic sticks and other things into the middle of our streets um, in order to try and do something. But we're not necessarily making it into people space. We're probably making it even a little more reinforced as auto space. The signal I get from all those ugly um, bright stripes and ugly white and yellow plastic sticks is that this is still car habitat and we're grudgingly accepting uh, that pedestrian might be there so we have to control <laughs> ourselves. Consider this. When they stapled something into the middle of this street, it was that monument. Uh, this is Seven Dials in London, a developer speculative project, uh, Hank Dittmar's favorite spot in London. Um, there's a thing in the middle of the road, so you slow down. And the space is traversed by lorries and taxi vans and cars, uh, people making deliveries, but it's also dominated by the pedestrians and the cyclists in that space. So that's a way of putting a thing in the middle of the road. For contrast, this is about ways of putting a thing in the middle of the road. What do you think? We have begun to introduce a new family of traffic calming devices and intersection types, including uh, the very important modern roundabouts. Um, but somehow, this one, with all of its the expense, it's practically gold-plated infrastructure, um, we still, and even the fancy light fixtures and so on, we still get all the signals that this is auto space. I would suggest we could do better. When they put a thing in the middle of the road in Savannah, in Oglethorpe's historic plan, this is how they did it. We go around like that. The square. So one sidebar on street trees. Um, this, is a, um, this is a pretty important piece of it. Not that every single street has to have street trees. Not that big deciduous trees are the right thing in every climate, uh, for example. But uh, in many, many, many circumstances, the right thing to do is to plant more trees. Um, and so here's a, a street where the developers just naturally knew the thing to do was to plant a lot of trees. They planted 38,000 trees. And now it's worth billions of dollars uh, to the tax base in Coral Gables, Florida. We'll consider this one. Uh, this is Riverside Drive, Robert Moses Project and on the Upper West Side in New York City, um, in which the street trees are part of how you know where you are, where the, the nature of Riverside Park meets Riverside Drive. And you know when you are because of the way they behave across time. And that's not just something that is important to old streets. It's something that you can get an immediate effect of even in new streets, even when you have to plant small trees. These were planted just about a decade and a half ago, um, and they've grown up quite nicely. And they're making a big difference to someone's daily life in that space. Now, they love narrow. But I do want to make one quick disclaimer, which is to say that the wide streets can be good, just not like this. Um, I could go on at length about this street, although going on at width might seem more appropriate. <laughs> I don't know, complete, it's got the bike lane. <laughs> Actually, as we traveled around, we got reinforced in the idea that some of the biggest, hardest working, highest volume, busy streets are still beautiful, uh, tremendously beneficial assets for their communities. They may not be intimate uh, and they may not be tranquil in the way that some say that leafy street in Coral Gables was. Uh, but they're still hugely beneficial as assets. This is one of the hardest working streets in Barcelona. Uh, and it's big and wide. It has tremendous traffic volumes every day and at the peak hour especially. But it also feels when you're there like a linear park, like a great place to do retailing, place there's room for transit. Uh, there's parking on that street. There are people sharing it on foot and on bikes. Uh, and they express uh, the story of their town. Uh, in its monumentation. Or look at this one. Um, you probably know the Cour Mirabeau. This is an older picture. It's been made even more pedestrian friendly. <laughs> but this was a 19th century road widening project. When the public works officials were once heroes, this is the kind of thing they did. They straightened out uh, a tangle of medieval streets and they put back something that became the postcard picture of the town. Not a road widening project that made things worse rather than better. Uh, when, when communities were extended, like when Savannah grew to the point of having Oglethorpe Avenue, which is a wide street with a promenade, or Commonwealth Avenue um, uh, in Back Bay in Boston was established. These are big, wide streets, but they are very good addresses. So I don't want you to think that just because we're fascinated with the small and narrow streets and love them, and that's mostly what we need, that we can't also 
find a way to make a difference on big streets. Uh, we spend a little time in our book on new streets because we realize such a what a battle it is to get a new street constructed uh, in the good old ways. This street in, it's the skinniest new street in Colorado is uh, called Swift Street, not for the, for the design speed, but for Peter Swift, the engineer who insisted it would be okay if we designed it that way. Um, so you know, new streets can be skinny, new streets can have trees, you know, give way kinds of dimensions. Um, you just have to fight for them. New streets can have those deflected vistas and the tight geometries that bring down the design speeds to conform to the public realm. Mostly what we need are to fix streets that already exist. And when you ask people about their own community, they often look around and they assume it's finished. It's already built out. There's nothing we can do. And so we draw a lot of before and after pictures to convince them that there is, in fact, room to grow and there's lots of room for change, especially as they tame some of those big and difficult suburban corridors. So we uh, spend a lot of time in our book on the concept of retrofit streets. Um, did you catch that? This is Second Avenue um, in New York. and what uh, on the Upper East Side and what John Massengale um, proposed here and, and, and we helped with was uh, actually deciding that every segment of that didn't have to be highway-like. This is actually under, uh, been torn up for the new subway anyway, so it's actually possible to put back something like a Great Rambla there. Even the little workaday streets, like this is a little alley in the 1990s in our town of South Miami, can turn into something better. This is how it looks just a couple of years later just taking back pavement, planting trees that were missing. Uh, this was turned into the social center of the neighborhood. How about this historic place? Does anybody recognize uh, this from Columbus? Uh, that's the cap at Union Station. Uh, the only thing that's historic about it is that it's one of the few places to ever try and build a new street right over the top of the interstate. But that's what they did. They actually tied together the two neighborhoods that had been severed by the interstate by building right on top of it. Um, and here's the cross section of that. Interstate 670 goes underneath it. And they reclaimed the space on top and made it into a street. Our favorite retrofit is in, is, uh, in Kensington in London. This is the way it used to look. They had fences of wrought iron and aluminum to keep the pedestrians on their sidewalks. Um, and the street itself was a riot of traffic markings and lights and um, pretty much just a traffic zoo. Uh, this is what it looked like not too very long ago. Uh, elected officials said, we can do better than this. And they held everybody to a high standard of keeping it simple. And they took back control of that street. They took out the fences. Um, they did a lot of counterintuitive things like reducing the dimensions to control the speeds and taking some of the reclaimed space and actually parking the bikes in the middle. What, what an invitation to jaywalking that is. Um, and the world did not come to an end. In fact, it's a very, very simple palette of gray on gray materials. Here's their way of making the, the buttons that a sight impaired person can see or can, can feel as they approach the crosswalk. Uh, what's so powerful about the Kensington example is that it's so simple. Well, everybody's not Kensington uh, or Coral Gables, so what about the rest of us? I'll show you an example of the south side in Chattanooga where the street strategy was the revitalization strategy. This is what, uh, in the late 1990s, what the south side looked like. Uh, north of there, much of downtown Chattanooga was enjoying revitalization, but in the south side, it was still uh, a, a bombed out, burned out, uh, and uh, deeply blighted place. Lots of vacant lots, lots of derelict buildings. Uh, th there was a street called Main Street, which was almost entirely vacant. Uh, the great old mixed use Main Street buildings of the past had uh, fallen into disuse. This is what it looked like. Uh, they came back and starting on the interior streets, they, they connected 17th Street here. And I'll show you the aerial photograph from the 1990s and 97, and then here's 2013. Um, they, the first move was to build a street, to establish a new address of confidence, which they could face with the fronts of new buildings and re-attract uh, uh, people to this place. And what is magical is that as soon as they got that going, then the main street turned back on. Uh, the, the chefs and the preservationists and the artists and the cyclists came, the shock troops of urban revitalization. Uh, the artists especially, who rooted around in all those old uh, vacant lots and, and uh, train shed properties and what have you, pulled out all the rusty old stuff they could find and welded it together to make beautiful gates and walls and fences that are art. Um, and now people go just to see that. This building on the main street 
turned into that building on the main street, which has the best restaurant in Chattanooga. It can be done. If we are diligent about it, we can take the streets that we've skipped over and we can turn them back into better assets. You just have to do it with street design. Thank you very much.